reacting live on YouTube as well. There's Dr. Nee. Hi, Bill. Hi, Hello. Andrew. We are. We have just started the live uh, broadcast, so the people are watching in on uh, Facebook uh, and on our live stream feed, as well as our Zoom feed. Anthony is handling the back end, so that you and I just have to worry about what we're talking about. In fact, I have to worry very little because you're going to be doing most of the uh, most of the of the talking. We told people we would start right on time. So we've got about another minute and I will introduce you and then we will begin. Okay, that sounds good. Sorry, I was just hopping off another call. So oh, that's fine. No, we knew that. that your time was tight and we appreciate you taking the time to do this uh, today. And uh, uh, we already have uh, almost 200 people um, listening in just on where we can count the Zoom. We don't know. Can't tell. I don't think, Anthony, how many are watching on the Facebook Live. Uh, Not yet. Yeah, Not but yet. we do know we have well over 500 uh, registrants, and we know that many of the people, we send everybody who registered a link, so many of them will watch the, uh, the recording rather than live. So uh, excellent turnout from right across the, right, literally from one end of the country to the other. So, uh, and every, every province, as far as I can see, uh, represented. And I have your slides in backup, Dion, if you want to share your screen and maybe oh, that, can... that'll be the way to go. And yeah. okay. Why don't you'll, I, why you'll know the, temp, the tempo better than I. And if there's any issue, I, I can pull them up as a backup. Okay, I will, I'll do that right now and see if I can pull them up if that's okay with you yeah. folks. Yes. Okay. And um, okay, let's see what we got here. Yep, uh, I can see them. You can see them. And then Plus, what, what happens if I go into presenter mode? Does it mean that you get there? Uh, that's now you just get the slide. And you don't get the, the little ones down the side. That's much better that way. OK, perfect. Then that's great. Now, it's a little bit above. So I do apologize. I'll be looking up a little bit. I've got a, two screens on the go. So OK, that's OK. I understand. All right. Well, Anthony, uh, we're uh, we're uh, almost at 250 people. We said we'd start on time, so I think we should. By the time I'm finished my short introduction, uh, those other people should be uh, online. I don't want to take away from the time that we we have. So, welcome everybody uh, to uh, the CARP presentation of uh, navigating the world of vaccines against COVID and influenza. Our uh, presenter today, our expert, is Dr. Dion Neen. He's a pediatrician working at the Pediatric Urgent Care Clinics in southwestern Ontario. He's also the county medical lead for major influenza activities. He's a graduate uh, from medical school in 1991 and did postgraduate work at uh, Michigan State and McMaster. He completed his fellowship in primary prevention of diseases and the clinical teaching at McMaster Children's Hospital. He's uh, as a practice consulting pediatrics in Southern Ontario and assistant clinical professor at McMaster University in the Department of Pediatrics for over 20 years and was the chief uh, of pediatrics at the Joseph Brandt Hospital in Burlington for four years. So having said all that just indicates uh, how lucky we are to have one of Canada's foremost experts in this area to speak to us today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Neem, I invite you to begin and thank you again for being part of the presentation today. Uh, Bill, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure and thanks very much. I, I will say I also um... I've, I've honed my vaccine skills because I, I work with uh, Sanofi now about three to four days a week, the clinic one to two days a week. And I'm, I'm, my title, I guess, is North American Senior Medical Expert, which really means I do a lot of research, do a lot of reading in vaccines and have the pleasure of talking to good folks like yourselves uh, about vaccines, uh, but, which is a bit of my passion there. So um, what I will say today, what we're going to do is just about 20 minutes of a quick chat, um, this to kind of have a, a baseline about what's going on with COVID and influenza and vaccines. You can see the title there, your questions and answered, navigating the world of vaccines against COVID-19 and influenza. And then we have a Q&A 
And uh, that way we can kind of uh, chew the fat, as it were, on, on this complicated science, which seems to have become mainstream since our friendly pandemic. So I'll go to the next slide here. So breaking the presentation up into um, five parts. So what are the clinical or the symptoms and signs, the cl clinical similarities of COVID-19 and influenza, uh, the long-term burden of influenza, which is a bit surprising, actually. And, uh, and COVID is starting to show a very similar trend as well. Talk about vaccine technologies, because that's advanced a lot since the pandemic, and then the effectiveness of vaccines. And most importantly, Health Canada, some really smart people there at the National Advisory of Community Immunizations making recommendations on what we should do with vaccines and what vaccines we should get. So when we look at the uh, impact of COVID-19 on Canadians, it does actually go beyond just uh, COVID. Now, COVID was bad enough. We had about 160,000 COVID hospitalizations and about um, 40,000 COVID deaths, and we're still counting on that. And interestingly, um, it was really quite age dependent. So those that make up 50 plus, um, that's about 76% making up of the hospitalizations, about 97% uh, making up of the COVID deaths. So if you're over 50 years of age, you're much more at risk of having bad outcomes than you are if you're younger. And then of course, a lot of people are talking about it in regard to being the collateral damage of COVID-19 and the restrictions of COVID-19. Lots of delays in, in uh, non-COVID related healthcare, surgeries particularly, surgeries in oncology particularly, um, lost time with loved ones and the impact on mental health. And I can tell you the kids particularly that I take care of regularly, um, mental health has been really bad. You're talking about say, for example, 15 to 20 year olds who are hormonally driven to uh, go out and uh, investigate and meet people and socialize and they were not allowed to. And it was very, very challenging on them and others as well too. I don't want to um, dismiss uh, the mental health of others as well. So when we look at COVID-19 and influenza, they share many symptoms and they share many of the same complications, the severe complications. And it's not surprising because they're both respiratory infections. So when you're looking at kind of the symptoms, COVID-19 influenza look the same on the outset. So because they're respiratory infections, you'll get cough and runny nose and sneezing and headache and sore throat but you'll also get these what we call body or constitutional symptoms where you have fever chills sweats fatigue lethargy and aches and pains covid is a little bit different though because it can give you some odd symptoms uh, one of which is shortness of breath this is actually acute respiratory distress syndrome and what that means is that your immune system is overworking it's overworking the virus, uh, the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2, which is in your lungs. And with that overactivity, it draws a lot of fluid in your lungs. So essentially, you're, you're having to, to breathe through fluid. There's an interface of fluid between your ability to exchange your, your, your carbon dioxide and your oxygen, and it makes it extremely difficult to, to, to breathe. And it's very dangerous. And it can take, uh, you know, in the intensive care unit on ventilators, it can take weeks to try to, to get all that fluid out. The loss of taste and loss of smell is an oddity with COVID, but that's because COVID actually attacks the nerves that provide for taste and smell, and that's why it can disrupt those two senses. And then both give long-term complications, and we've heard that quite a bit now, long COVID, but we're still trying to figure out what long COVID is. But we are very understanding of what long-term complications can occur with influenza, and I'll go into that a little bit as we move through the presentation. So one of the things that we've, uh, we've figured out is that um, influenza and COVID viruses impact everyone, but there are certain population groups which are, are, are surely at risk. So when you look go from left to right here, the high risk for uh, severe illness are in older adults, are in people with chronic medical conditions, such as lung disease, heart disease, kidney disease, and diabetes. Um, I get a lot of questions. Uh, from people. So I have symptoms, but it's not COVID. So am I safe? I'm safe, right? Well, actually, no. So here's the thing. Many of the restrictions have really pushed down the viruses that have been circulating. And we've really seen that as we've lifted the restrictions. There was a whole pile of viruses sitting on the sidelines waiting to jump into the game. And they did in April and May of, and now June of this year. And influenza has really taken off. So as COVID is starting to come down, influenza is, is rocketing up. So 
one of the things about influenza, which has been for almost a decade, we've been trying to, as physicians and researchers, we're trying to tell people, is that don't underestimate influenza. And influenza is terribly underestimated because people see what they see. So what you tend to see is influenza as a respiratory infection. But even that alone gives rise to 2.5 million cases per season on average, 12,000 hospitalizations on average, and 3,500 deaths on average across Canada. But if you look at things that are not respiratory, that we know are actually precipitated by uh, the influenza infection, then you start to add in these conditions beyond the lung. These are heart attacks, strokes, loss of autonomy, worsening of chronic illness. Then the burden just goes right through the roof. And these are all things that you want to try to avoid clearly. So when we look at the complications of influenza, we divide it into two different sections. On the left, you can see it's direct effects or respiratory because it's an upper respiratory, lower respiratory infection. And then the indirect effects on the right, which affects other organs. So what I see a lot in the clinic is, for example, people who come with influenza, they have exacerbation of underlying lung diseases, such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. They tend to get a lot of secondary bacterial infections. So in the upper part of the respiratory system, they'll get ear infections or sinus infections, um, which are bacterial in nature, acute otitis media, sinusitis. And then in the lower part of the respiratory, they'll get secondary bacterial pneumonia. And that is really quite dangerous stuff. It's dangerous because it's in your lungs, of course, a vital organ. But it's also dangerous because the bacteria sometimes will break out of the lungs and drop into your bloodstream. So you have a bacteremia or worse off, a septicemia where you're really being overwhelmed. And, and that comes with a 40% mortality. When you're talking about indirect, so outside of the lung, you have two basic issues that occur. You can trigger disease or you can exacerbate chronic disease. The triggering of the disease tends to be in the cardiovascular system. So what you're doing there is the stimulus of the influenza stimulates your immune system, cytokines particularly, to try to find things that shouldn't be in the body. Well, they find atherosclerotic plaques, which shouldn't be in the body, which are in the blood vessels. It breaks them down. It creates a bleed in that blood vessel. The body's response is to fix that bleed. To, to set off a coagulation pathway, which creates platelets to clump and clots. The only problem with the clot is it blocks the vessel so all the blood can't get distal into the vital organ. So if it happens to be in the coronary artery of the heart, you can't get blood distal to the clot, you have a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. If unfortunately that happens to be in the brain, then you can't get blood beyond that clot in the brain and you end up having a stroke. The exacerbations are diseases that I'm sure you're very familiar with, kidney disease, diabetes, and we can talk, and there's many others. So the, the complications um, are just sort of like concerns that we have with influenza because they exacerbate beyond if you do not have influenza. So for example, if you are a person who has um, chronic heart disease, you or, or sorry, even someone who doesn't have chronic heart disease, someone who's actually just hanging around, having um, influenza, you have a six times more likely chance of having a heart attack within that week of having influenza than you would the year before getting influenza or the year after getting influenza. So in other words, just by hanging around um, and getting influenza, you have six times more likely chance of having a heart attack right there within that week of having influenza. And that's because of the process I just spoke to you before on the previous slide. When you talk about diabetes, there is an increased likelihood with influenza that you will be hospitalized for influenza. A lot of this has to do with the fact that it's difficult when you have influenza to basically to eat. And so you say, well, if I can't eat, I better not take my insulin or my blood sugar will go too low. But unfortunately, that sets off a different mechanism to create energy, which is breakdown of fat. And when you break down fat, you produce acid. And then you get into a state called diabetic ketoacidosis, which is life-threatening. And so you have to be very careful with influenza and diabetes. So in that, Diabetes Canada and the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, they recommend that people get specifically with heart disease and diabetes, 
get influenza vaccines. Dr. Deem, if I could interrupt for just a moment, we're getting a clicking sound that seems to be coming from you. Is there, is your chair or something uh, making an extra noise there? <laughs> you know what, I will, I, you know, I will, I will, I will be more sedentary. Sorry, it, it's not, it's not horrible, but it would be helpful if. Uh, okay. I'm wondering if it, where your microphone is, doctor. And if it could be rubbing on your zipper or something like that, because it's that type of clicking noise. You are, I think you are right. I will lean forward slightly and I will stop right. rocking. And <laughs> that's you. why that's why we have Anthony doing the technical backup, because he knows these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that also gives people a little bit of a break, because I do apologize. Yeah. So I was uh, downloading a lot of information there. Okay, so uh, I will do my best. Just let me know again, Bill. So, okay, so hospitalization of older adults can lead to functional decline. And this is something that sometimes people don't expect until they get uh, into uh, the hospital. So when you are just traveling along, life is great, and all of a sudden you get influenza and you have to go to the hospital, you're generally, bed, you have bed rest, you know, either trying to hydrate you, the antibiotics, whatever it might be. And when you lay down in the bed for a long period of time, what happens is that you actually have uh, atrophy of your muscles. You become very weak. And so when you get out of the bed after 10 or 14 days, uh, what can occur is that uh, you can't walk. So you're, you're, you're going through a disability. You might have to be in a wheelchair. You might have to be a walker, but you have to regain that strength. Some people become uh, so disabled that they, they are, have to go to an assisted living or they have to even go to a long-term care because they've lost their autonomy. They've become dependent. So influenza can produce significant long-lasting functional disc, uh, decline in older adults. And this is a very, we're very concerned about these types of things from a healthcare perspective. So different kinds of vaccines. Are there different kinds of vaccines? Yes, there are tons of different types of vaccines. There's always vaccine companies that are doing their best to improve on vaccines, make them better. And, but just as a general, this is a general, what is the goal of a vaccine? Well, the goal of a vaccine is to introduce a harmless piece of the virus or the bacteria to your body. And they call that an antigen. And they're doing that in order that our immune system can learn how to identify through antibodies and destroy the virus and bacteria if the real, what we call the wild uh, virus, comes in and infects us, if we encounter it. So our body will say, oh, I recognize you, um, and they are prepared to, 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 kill that, to kill that virus or bacteria immediately before it has an opportunity to cause disease itself. So when we look at the considerations when, when designing vaccines, there's three kind of really important aspects. The first important one, as I mentioned on the last slide, is the antigen. What is an antigen? It's just a, just a part of the virus and bacteria that we want to teach our body to protect us. Now, it depends on the virus or the bacteria, which will give rise to what the antigen will be. So, for example, if we're looking at COVID-19 or we're looking at influenza, what we're looking at is surface protein um, that help the virus enter the cell. So in the case on the left side of COVID-19, um, this is a spike protein, the S protein you might be familiar with. That's what we use as the antigen for COVID-19 vaccines. And then if it's influenza, we use what we call the hemagglutinin H protein. Uh, and sitting again, you can see by the arrows, sitting on the top of the surface of the of the the, vi the individual virus, in this case, the influenza virus. So influenza and COVID-19 vaccines individually teach our immune system to recognize and neutralize each specific virus. So the other thing that's really important in this is there are different vaccine technologies. There's different options, how we make them and how we deliver the antigens. And some technologies are just better than others. So we want to obviously get the one that's the best. So you have a direct vaccine directly delivering the antigen to the body. So we can actually produce those um, antigens and put them directly into the body. So these are known as inactivated vaccines or recombinant uh, protein recombinant vaccines. So the inactivated vaccine are the ones that you sort of know commonly for the flu vaccine. So, and the COVID vaccines, you can do it as well too. So you're actually growing the influenza virus or the COVID virus, and then you inactivate them and you purify them. So all you do is take those surface proteins and you put them 
into the vial, and that's what goes into your arm. In the re protein recombinant vaccine, it's a little bit more high tech. What they actually do is they take the recipe of that protein and they put it into a system. Uh, Sanofi has a system called the BEST system. It's called the baclovirus expression system technology. And they're actually taking that recipe, the mRNA, and they're putting it into a baclovirus, which goes through it in the system and it just pumps out the protein. You take those proteins, you put them in a vial, and that's what goes into your arm. And that's the way they do it. So they're actually taking the antigen or the protein in, proteins in these cases, and they're putting them into the vaccine, and that's how they do it. There's a different way that is only emerged because of our nice little pandemic COVID-19. And they're actually taking the message, once again, it's the mRNA, they're taking the message or the recipe of the protein, in the case of COVID, the spike protein, in the case of influenza, the hemagglutin H, and they actually take that and they either can place it in a viral vector like an adenovirus, that would be the AstraZeneca or the J&J &J vaccine, and they put that into the body. And it's our own body which reads that recipe and then produces those antigens, which our immune system understands and creates immunity to. The mRNA, that's the Moderna or the um, Pfizer, BioNTech, they actually take the mRNA, the recipe, and they put it in this nanolipid particle, and then they put it in the, in the, in, into our arm. And then again, we use our cellular machinery to read the recipe, to produce the protein, and then the protein then is seen by our immune system, and that's what generates the immune system response. I will say, very cool technology. <laughs> At Sanofi, we are so impressed by it. We've actually generated a what we call the mRNA center of excellence. And we're looking at all kinds of different assets on that, not just COVID-19, which we have COVID-19 that's in production. Uh, it's in research right now for mRNA COVID-19. We've got an influenza in research. We've got a number of different assets, other infectious disease assets in production. So I think you're going to see a lot of, about the new mRNA vaccines as we move forward in the next five to 10 years. No, actually less than that, next three to five to 10 years. And then of course, at the end, there's other considerations. For example, like how much antigen should we put in the vaccine or how many different antigens should we put in the vaccine? For example, when we started um, flu vaccines, we used to have 7.5 micrograms of one different antigen. Then it grew to 15 micrograms of the one antigen. Then we started with two antigens, two A's. And then we started with three antigens, two A's and a B. And then we, now we've got four in there. So two A's and two B's. And then the, the question is, should we maybe use an adjuvant, which is known as a stimulant? Should we draw the immune system towards it? Is that going to help us? It has in, in some cases. I mean, for example, in varicella zoster virus, which is shingles, the adjuvant that seems to be very, very, helpful in, in, in increasing the ability of the vaccine to work. Hasn't worked as well in influenza, but that's okay. We've used a different approach, which is a sort of a high dose approach. And I'll talk about that. So when we talk about the different technologies, um, there's the inactivated influenza vaccine manufacturing technologies. And these are the ones that you've seen and heard a lot about. So for example, there's the egg-based technology. So essentially that's where you use, you make the, the viruses in the eggs and then you break them down, you purify them and you take out uh, those antigens. In this case, the example here is actually, they use 60 micrograms of each of the different um, types, type 2As, 2Bs, and they call that the high-dose vaccine. Uh, they have an egg-based adjuvanted vaccine, which is three types, um, and they use the standard dose and they're, they're, they're trying to stimulate more of the response with that adjuvant. You've got the cell cultured base. Instead of using eggs, you're using cells. These are like monkey kidney cells. Uh, and they still produce, uh, they produce the, the, the virus within there, and purify them, get the proteins out, and then they can make a quadrivalent vaccine. And then we've got this recombinant vaccine. This is what I was talking about just before. This is where you take um, the messenger and you put it into a technology system, the best technology system, the baclovirus expression system technology. This is sort of an interesting one as well. So not only are you using sort of a different way of making it, but you all, this is sort of like also a high dose vaccine. So instead of having 15 micrograms, this has 45 micrograms. This is a vaccine that's generally used for people 50 to 64 years of age. So they feel they need a little bit more of a boost. Talk about that in a minute. 
And, um, and that's why it, it's sort of a cool, cool little invention there. So uh, why are there so many different kinds of, of vaccines? It's confusing. Well, it's because there's a diversity of uh, diseases. Um, some um, viruses or bacteria respond to these different technologies differently. And uh, some of uh, these technologies do better with some viruses, some do better with their bacteria. Then there's a diversity of people, of course, as we all know, age. Uh, as you get older, you do tend to have some issues where you're gonna have a diminishing of your immune system response. As people with different medical conditions, they will also have some issues um, because they, they are sick and they might uh, not be able to like, immunocompromise people. They might not respond so well. And it just improve protection. Different vaccines just work differently and different vaccines work better with, with certain things than others. So we strive to build better vaccines to meet the needs of different populations because that seems to have come up. Um, I'm taking precautions and I'm fairly healthy. Would a vaccine even make a difference? Boy, do I get this question a lot. So my answer is because I have done a lot of work in primary prevention of disease. Um, I did a lot of training at Michigan State and I did a lot of training at McMaster, but my final year, two years of training at McMaster was actually in primary prevention of disease. How do we stay healthy? And there's four basic pillars that make you stay healthy. Uh, the first pillar is like exercise. The second pillar is nutrition. The third pillar is mindfulness, keeping a positive attitude. And the fourth pillar is vaccines. And it's not based on one is not more important than the two or three or four. They're all important. You have to have balance in all of them. And if you're missing one, you know, you, you've got a gap. So even if you're, you know, uh, an Olympian senior or, you know, if you don't vaccinate, you're opening yourself up to infectious diseases. And as I've tried to talk about in the previous slides, these types of infectious diseases can be flipping the first domino of a cascading of bad events that occur, getting you from this gentleman who is on the left, an Olympic senior, who then gets himself into a situation where he is, you know, in a wheelchair and he's dependent. And so, and this can happen within a month. Uh, and it's, and, and that we just want to avoid that. Life should go like this. Life doesn't need a sharp left or a sharp right where things are not going so well. So I think it's really important to always address the four pillars of health, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, a very positive attitude towards life and vaccination. One of the things that we've learned over the years is that one size vaccines don't necessarily fit all. Uh, we noticed this about 20 years ago, actually, when we were using just the standard dose influenza vaccines. And we found that people that were between 15 and 64 years of age, they tended to respond quite well to the standard dose vaccine. But when you looked at people 65 years of age and older, they in fact didn't respond very well. You can see that in the black line, which is the above line, they have a much better response, 15 to 64 years of age, than the people 65 years of age and older, the blue line. And of course, there's a gap in between. And that gap, unfortunately, is the effectiveness or the efficacy of the vaccine. So we were striving to do better than that. And this is where Sanofi came up with the high dose influenza vaccine program. Um, and, and you noticed in the previous slides, there's one vaccine that has four times the antigen content. That's the standard high dose. And the new vaccine, the recombinant one, which has three times the, the normal antigen dose of the standard dose of 45 micrograms. But that's all great. Dion's just yakking away here. But what does Health Canada recommend on vaccines? Because these are, again, like I say, very bright people, National Advisory Committee on Immunization. They've all done as much or more <laughs> uh, vaccine research and, and, and vaccine studying than I have, and they make recommendations. So one of the first things I think it's really important is they recommend uh, influenza vaccines for all individuals six months and older, but they particularly look at people that are at high risk. And who are those folks that are at high risk? Well, people that are in nursing homes, people with have um, chronic diseases, people that are 65 years of age and older. Now, what's really interesting is our counterparts, uh, the ACIP, the American Committee on Immunization Practices, they actually say people over 50 are at high risk, which yeah, I know it's different, but everyone has their opinion. So 65 in Canada, 50 in the US. Children, six to nine months are at high risk, healthcare workers, essential community workers, because they're so exposed. Pregnant women are at 
high risk people that are in close contact of people that are individuals high risk should get vaccinated they're at high risk and it because they could pass the virus on and indigenous people who have a very different um, immune system towards um, respiratory infections like influenza so the national advisory community immunizations they make recommendations every year 2022 20 23 advanced copy is showing us the influenza recommendations to ages. So if you look on the left, go to the right, 18 to 59 years of age, there's a number of different vaccines. And so what the recommendations are is any of the available influenza vaccines authorized for this age group should be used in adults that are 18 to 59 years without contraindications or precautions for those vaccines. Um, there's an exception um, there is some evidence that the influenza inactivated vaccine may produce better efficacy than the live attenuated influenza vaccines in healthy adults. That live attenuated influenza vaccine should not be used in pregnant people. Um, it should not be used in people with chronic conditions, and, you know, and with, there's a long list that I won't go into now, but particularly people with immunocompromising conditions and also healthcare workers, because healthcare workers could take the live attenuated virus and they could pass it on to people that are immunocompromised and could give some problems. When you're 60 to 64 years of age, there's a number of vaccines that you can get. Any of the available vac influenza vaccines authorized in this age group should be used in this uh, group for people who don't have contraindications. What's interesting about that is we just brought in, this is Snopes product, just brought in uh, the recombinant influenza vaccine for, that's the one I was talking about, it's a bit of a high dose, it's instead of 15 micrograms, 45 micrograms. So that's actually available 2022, 2023 season. And 65 years of age and over, going left to right, uh, there's two different uh, recommendations um, in, in this statement of, for people 65 years of age and older. The individual level decision making says that high dose, uh, the, the vaccine that has four times the antigen content compared to the standard dose, high dose should be used over standard dose because um, there's good evidence of high dose providing better protection than standard dose, particularly in one of the influenza A's, uh, which is quite aggressive, known as the H3N2 strain. And then there's the public health program level uh, decision-making, which says that you can use any of the, the available vaccines in the provincial program. When we look at COVID, uh, so there's recommendations for the COVID-19 vaccines, and that's to all individuals aged over five years of age with boosters if you're over 12 years of age. So for the majority of people starting left, going to right, um, it's two doses that you should be getting, two primary series, a booster dose three and a booster dose four. I'm in that situation where next week I'm just getting my booster dose four because I'm a frontline healthcare professional in Ontario. Um, immu immunocompromised people like my father-in-law. So he has to, had to get a primary series of three, one, two, and three. He had his, he's had his booster dose four and he's had his, just had his booster dose five. Um, and generally for the booster doses, it should be six months after the last time you had a dose. And why? Well, because we're continuing to boost your protection, your antibody levels up higher, um, you know, to protect against these variant strains like Omicron. And also, but most importantly, I think to protect against serious outcomes. So serious outcomes like hospitalization and of course death. Now, this is evolving. That's a pandemic or it sort of was a pandemic. I don't know if they still call it a pandemic. I don't think they should, but um, it's evolving. We're learning. We're figuring things out. We don't know what the variants are gonna do. Maybe the variants will change to something more problematic. Maybe it'll change to something less problematic. We can only hope about that. So do I really need to get a vaccine for COVID and a vaccine for influenza? Yes. So there's a lot of issues around this that created confusion. So first of all, in early 2019, 2020 season, uh, for influenza, we had already locked down because of the pandemic. And because we'd locked down, there really wasn't any influenza. People are like, well, influenza went away. No, didn't go away. Actually, what was happening, as I mentioned this before, it was sitting in the sidelines. As we elevated and got rid of the restrictions, all of a sudden influenza, H3N2, H1N1, two influenza Bs, they all hopped into the game. Jumped over the boards, hopped into the game. I have not seen this much influenza in my entire 30-year career. And it is intense because we've all been kind of hiding at home. Uh, we haven't seen any viruses. Our immune systems are sort of down. And so the kids that are coming, in particular that I'm seeing, they are you know, showing everything. 
high fevers. Fevers, you know, 103, 104, 40 degrees Celsius, 41 degrees Celsius. Chills, sweats, lethargy, fatigue, tired. Um, they've got all the respiratory tract infection symptoms, which is leading to secondary bacterial infections, ears and, and, and lower respiratory tract infections like pneumonias, uh, exacerbations of their lung diseases like chronic lung disease, uh, chronic, chronic lung disease like asthma, uh, particularly for the kids. And it's wild. Um, so yes, be prepared um, for what's coming, which generally we don't have influenza in June. We have it in November, December, January, February. So I think it would be a very good idea to get an influenza vaccine. And I would caution, I think it's probably a good idea to get COVID-19. I don't think COVID-19 is going away. It's just taking a bit of a lull. Now. And when you lull, it gives an opportunity for people to lose their immunity and then it'll sway back up again. So I think you're probably going to see, and don't quote me on this, but I think you're probably going to see an influenza season this winter and a COVID season hitting at the same time. So I highly recommend getting both of those vaccines. Can you get both of those vaccines at the same time? Yes, you can. Um, you can, and we know this because of a study that was done by Sanofi and done by Moderna. The Sanofi was the high dose vaccine for people 65 years of age and older. And the COVID vaccine was the Moderna COVID mRNA vaccine. They gave them together. And the study showed that it was safe, it was effective, and it was easy. There's one arm here, one arm there, COVID, influenza, and um, you did get a bit of side effects a little bit more, that's, but that's okay. At least you stimulated nothing that's, you know, going to, you know, either outside the sore arms, pain, a bit of swelling there, and sometimes a little bit of fever. Nothing that's going to really slow you down. Um, but um, you did garner some good protection in both areas, both the COVID, both the influenza. So in this summary, you know, we're at all the different companies we're just trying to build better vaccines to meet the needs of the different populations because we've realized that is an unmet medical need. If you're a baby or if you're older, you deal with vaccines differently. So we have to address that. We've tried to do that. So in influenza, high dose in regard to COVID-19 um, with different types of uh, new technologies, even some adjuvantive technologies coming in as well too, just to make sure that you're safe and that you're healthy. We like the road to go straight. We don't want to left turn into the hospital. We don't want to right turn into the hospital. We don't need that type of thing. Stay healthy, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, positive attitude, and vaccinate. So I'll leave it at that. I do apologize. I think I talked a little on the show. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Neems. You certainly covered a lot of material, but I know you answered many of the questions that are on uh, uh, people's, uh, people's minds right uh, now. And I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask, which you, which you answered, but I know there are a number of other questions that Anthony uh, has for us. So I'll ask him to uh, direct those to you and tell everybody that we will continue uh, for another 20 three uh, minutes when we'll have to close down, but this uh, program is being recorded and will be available on the CARP uh, website. And for all of you who have registered, uh, you'll be able to get uh, the link to it in an email that Anthony will be sending out to you uh, in the next day or so. So Anthony, over to you to ask some of those questions, please. Thanks very much, Bill. I'll turn my video back on as well. And uh, maybe Dr. Dion, if you could stop sharing your screen, we'll see everyone in full scope. Yeah, Here we okay. go. Uh, the, first, the first question is actually from me. I, I have uh, heard a lot about the, uh, and learned a lot from, from you about the effects of a influenza vaccine in preventing heart attacks and, and other uh, inflammation issues. Uh, we've heard uh, from the people who are concerned about COVID vaccines having side effects that there are more unexplained heart attacks and things in, in the population today. Could that be a result of the spread of the COVID virus around the country and people having these effects that they don't know are actually related to having the COVID vaccine virus, excuse me, the COVID virus? Yeah, that, so that's a really good uh, uh, question, Anthony. Thank you so much. And so as a general kind of observation, Upper respiratory tract infections, influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, now COVID, 
science has shown us, and there was a gentleman named Jeff Kwong, actually, who's from University of Toronto, and he looked at the Ontario Healthcare Insurance Plan, the, the, the kind of the data that was around that. And he was the person that found out that you're six times more likely to get a heart attack with influenza. He also found that you're three times more likely to get um, a heart attack after having respiratory syncytial virus. And so we suspect the same thing with COVID-19, because these respiratory viruses just provide the same immunological response, which is cytokines. Cytokines are bouncing around all over the place, and they're the generalized area of the immune system. They're just looking for things that shouldn't be there. COVID shouldn't be there. Influenza shouldn't be there. RSV shouldn't be there. So kill them. That's a good news story. Unfortunately, they go after things like atherosclerotic plaques. They break the atherosclerotic plaques. That causes eventually cascading it the coagulation system to a clot. If it's in your coronary artery, heart attack. If it's in your brain, stroke. And so it's sort of, it makes a lot of sense, although it hasn't really been delineated in science because we're just getting out of the pandemic, that yes, if you get COVID, you will most likely get this cascading pattern and get a heart attack. Now, the other thing is, is that COVID itself as a virus can spin around through the blood. And because it's attaching itself to ACE2 receptors, those ACE2 receptors are in fact in blood vessels. And so it can actually attack in blood vessels. So it has a double whammy, not just like influenza and RSV, but it itself can attack the heart and it can give rise to issues. And so you've got a double whammy for getting heart attacks with COVID-19. Mm. Uh, that's, it makes a lot of logical sense. And I thought it might be, thanks for that, that information. Uh, another question related to side effects, uh, but of the COVID-19 shot, seniors who had tinnitus or a flare-up of shingles, other uh, what they perceive to be side effects of the COVID-19 virus, should they still be getting further shots? Yeah, you have to really watch out for side effects. Um, there's side effects that'll occur when you get a COVID-19. Some of those will just be temporal. In other words, they'll be just in association in time of the time that you got your COVID-19. Some will then be actually causative. And so our Health Canada, um, even all the different vaccine companies, they actually have a, an area called pharmacovigilance. And they will assess that. Was it just luck or bad luck? You got this, you know, the, the, the vaccine and got this at the same time or within a week, or was it actually causative? And so there are some that are definitely causative to the mRNA vaccines. For example, the, the pericarditis, the myocarditis in the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech. Those are the ones that we talk about. There are definitely ones in the AstraZeneca that are noticing clots, clot formation, particularly cerebral clots. So those are definitely associated. Um, I, at this point, and I haven't heard that shingles was, frankly. And so you got to be careful about that. Maybe the person got the vaccine then got shingles. Remember, one in three people over the age of 65 or one in three people throughout their life who get chickenpox will get shingles. So the opportunity to of a, a, a huge population getting vaccinated for people to get COVID-19 vaccine and then get shingles is there. I haven't seen that causative correlation yet, Anthony. And as the flu virus seems to be here already and is circulating, should we be getting our flu vaccines earlier this year since it's imminent? Yeah. So that's a huge, that's a huge, yes, that would be nice, but there, there aren't flu vaccines right now, um, essentially in, in, in the Northern hemisphere, because we got them back in November. And unfortunately they only last about six months. So then when we lifted restrictions, all of our, I mean, I get vaccinated every year because I'm a healthcare professional, but um, my, I, my, I had no immunity. My immunity was gone after that six months. So now that we don't really have it, this is why we're seeing the worst of the worst. I, like I say, 30 years, I haven't seen an influenza like this and the kids being this sick and people being this sick with influenza, but we're going to have to wait until basically next um, November again. And when the influenza vaccines come back and around for the specific circulating strains of the 2022-2023 season. They may be the same as the 2021-22. I don't think so. 
looks like they're going to be different. And so we, we wait for that shot to come through and be built up. Uh, and also we're going to have to watch for the COVID-19. That may resurge. It may be the same Omicron. It may be different. There are new COVID-19 vaccines coming out. Sanofi and GSK in association with the U.S. BARDA. They have generated the vaccine. It's a bit of an old school. It's not an mRNA. It's an antigen producing with an adjuvanted system. That should be here around September as well in Canada, maybe a little earlier in the States, uh, October in Canada. And so then you've got then you've got an arsenal of two things that are more closely related. So influenza more closely related to what's circulating uh, for the influenza season in 2020. To 2023, and then a more old school vaccine, which will have a little bit more protection towards Omicron because it's a later stage. It's not the Wuhan strain, it's a later stage beta, if you remember all those things. Anyway, um, but it's, it, you have an arsenal of two different vaccines, which you can get at the same time, two arms, shot, shot, and that'll be, that'll be really essentially what you can do. You can't really get an influenza vaccine now. And Bill, part of our role here at CARP is educating and creating awareness amongst our members and our cohort of the importance of, of accessing these vaccines. And perhaps this question from Bill, from another Bill is to both of you. Uh, there's a sense that studies that look at the COVID anti-vax movement and whether there's a predisposition for those who find themselves with either hesitancy or anti-vaccination, does that uh, impede their willingness to get the flu shot as well. Bill, you want to jump in on that one? <laughs> really, really uh, a good question, but uh, uh, tough to uh, tough tough to answer. Uh, certainly, uh, if people want to find an excuse, if you like, to not getting uh, uh, the shots, then that's one of the convenient ones uh, uh, these days. We just hope more and more people are being educated by sessions like this from experts like uh, Dr. Neem, so that those questionable beliefs uh, that really uh, deny the, the real science behind it, that they are uh, diminished and uh, more and more people can understand the real facts about how helpful vaccines can be and how necessary they are if we're going to stay overall healthy, especially as we grow older. Yeah, I, mean, I can only echo what, you know, what Bill's saying. I mean, over the, the decades, what I've heard is a lot of people telling people what to do you shouldn't get a vaccine because of this, this, and this reason. But where are those people when that person didn't get the vaccine because they told them not to, got sick? They're gone. You can't find them. So be very careful who you're listening to. Be very careful who you're taking advice from. Science, scientists are good to take advice from because scientists do science in order to clarify a question. How well does this vaccine work? How safe is this vaccine? I have a, my neighbor right across, right across the street there. <laughs> Can't see him. Uh, she called me and said, listen, my aunt and my uncle are here from British Columbia. And uh, my uncle only got one uh, COVID vaccine and he's got uh, chronic lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, what should we do? And I said, get me his health card. And as fast as I could, I called the local, uh, we have Shoppers Drug Mart here in Ontario, and I called the local Shoppers Drug Mart and I got him a, a antiviral prescription for Paxlovid because that was hopefully going to do well for him. And he, I, I don't know, I, 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 he was doing well last time I spoke. Then his wife, my, <laughs> my neighbor called me again and she called me and said, you know, they were told that, you know, we shouldn't get the COVID vaccine, right? I know we're talking about influenza, but COVID vaccine, same thing. And she, she tested positive for COVID as well. Hi, it's Dion again. Could you uh, write a prescription for Paxlovid? Like I had to, you know, so that you are playing with fire if you happen to be over 65 years of age, over 50 years of age, over 65 years, having chronic condition with these upper respiratory tract infections like uh, COVID and influenza. I, you saw the initial um, slide, which basically said 160,000 hospitalizations, 40,000 deaths, the vast majority of those people that were hospitalized, 76% were over 50 years of age, and the vast majority that died, 97% were, were 
over 50 years of age. I mean, we are susceptible to having bad outcomes. Listen to, watch who you're listening to, you know, listen to scientists, listen to science. And please, I think from my perspective, this season particularly, try to find yourself an influenza vaccine, a really good one, um, and, and also a good COVID vaccine. Bill, there's one question I wanted to add before but perhaps you ask yours, but Barbara was asking, is there work being done to combine common vaccines like COVID and influenza into one shot, similar to what they've done with measles, mumps, and rubella, et cetera? I just read about that, actually. And uh, so they do have a study that's out there um, and they're doing it. But I, I, this is the thing is that the study and then going through the regulatory process and getting it licensed within Canada, that's a whole different story. So I'm reading about what they're doing, but I haven't seen anything hitting the regulatory. Uh, Health Canada regulates it, says, yes, you can use it. I haven't seen anything like that. So I, I think you're going to be into two arms for at least this, the, the upcoming season for sure. One, one arm for COVID, one arm for influenza. I would only add to that, Anthony, that one of the, th the things that we learned from COVID, probably one of the only good things, is that Canada can move faster when it comes to getting new available drugs in the country. And we need all of us to tell the politicians, the people we vote for, to speed up that process. We now know it can happen. So if that, uh, if that vaccine, combined vaccine, becomes available, Canadians should get it as fast as anybody else in the country. And at the moment, they won't. Uh, we need to change the system. So that will happen. Another vaccine that CARP is advocating that our members get is the shingles vaccine. Uh, if they're in seeing their pharmacist for their COVID booster, can they get the sing shingles shot at the same time? Oh, um, darn it. I, I think it's yes. I'm pretty sure it's yes, but I don't, I, I, oh, I feel a little insecure about that. No, it is yes. Yes, you can. You can. You can get the, the two shots at the same time. Of course, ask your pharmacist and they'll tell you for sure. The, there's two shingles vaccines, uh, which is interesting. Um, there's a vaccine that's a shingles that's high dose. Um, and there's a vaccine shingles that is adjuvanted. The adjuvanted one is from our colleagues at, at GlaxoSmithKline. That is an extremely good vaccine. It's two shots. I've already got it myself. Um, and, uh, and so that's the adjuvanted shingles vaccine, Shingrix, that you would like to get. What's really interesting about that, and, and nature is an odd place, but it seems that the high dose actually works better for influenza than the adjuvanted, but in, 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 in influenza, but in, as I say, like in, in the, the varicella zoster virus or shingles, it seems to be the adjuvanted that works better than the high dose. So it's weird, but that's just science telling me. So. Another question. Uh, this one says, we've had COVID when we were due for our fourth booster at Easter. And we've been told we should wait three months from that time to get our fourth booster. Would it be better to wait until the fall so we'll have a more recent booster when it's closer to flu and COVID season coming back? Yeah, I mean, that, that's sort of everyone's individual call, but um, they're actually just, you just, they're just doing six months. Uh, it's vaccine to vaccine. Um, you can do vaccines really closely. Eh? Like you can do six, if you remember in the early days, it was like uh, six weeks to eight weeks apart. Um, they only in time, they've discovered that it's probably better to go out to, um, it's probably better to go out to six months because the dur durability lasts a little bit longer that way. But you, you don't have to, don't get confused by the fact that you had COVID and, and whatnot, because we're not even really that sure what happens when you get COVID to your immune system. We've, we've studied it, but not intensely like we've done with the vaccines. So I would suggest stay on your schedule. So if it is a booster, then it should be a, a six months after your, your, your second or third dose, depending on whether you're immunocompromised or not. And then if it's the second booster, that should be six months from the first booster. So just remember six months. I think that's the best way to do it. A question from Doreen. Uh, she says she lost a little bit of connection there, but how can an individual who doesn't have access to a quick COVID test differentiate between whether they have the cold, influenza, COVID, or something else? Yeah, that's very difficult. I would say close to impossible. Um, you know, it, that, that's why the test is there. Um, so there, as I mentioned before, there are some distinguishing features which influenza is not going to give you, which is the smell um, and the taste. Um, and you lose your taste, you lose your smell, you particularly lose your smell. But outside of that, from a clinical perspective, it's, it is quite difficult to distinguish the two. 
So I would say that, you know, you've got about a week period um, to, to, to actually get your rapid COVID or your PCR COVID is better. Um, so if you can get to it, don't, don't feel like you're compromised because of the fact that you didn't get on day one or day two. Um, it, but that, that's, a, that's a very good question. And those are the problems and the limitations with what you know, we're being provided right now. A lot of people come to me and say, I'd like to get a COVID test. And so you, you, know, you can go down there and try to get it. I think they've got them there at Shoppers Drug Mart. They've got them there. But sometimes it's hard to get hold of them. But I think the key thing to your question is that it can be within five to seven days, right? So you get the symptoms, you can, you've, got, you've got time. You've got time to prove that you had COVID. And perhaps a question for both gentlemen, uh, a bit on CARB subject to see Bill, uh, what provinces right now can a senior access the higher dose flu vaccine out without any out of pocket expense? And the question specifically from Adeline or Adeline is when is Canada going to get the message that low income seniors can't afford the shingles vaccine? So. Well, good, good uh, questions and uh, certainly agree with the, her last point uh, as you stated it. But uh, uh, there are a number of provinces who now uh, have the vaccine uh, free of charge, including, and I'm going from memory, I wish Lynn was still with us, she'd remember, uh, PEI, um, uh, Ontario, Alberta, uh, all I have it uh, available. The others in various uh, in various degrees. Some have it for only for those at high risk or in in long term care. And then we have problems with places like Ontario, where it's available on paper, but the delivery to uh, pharmacies and places people can get it was so checkered and inefficient last year, and I use that word intentionally, inefficient, that people that wanted it couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't get it when they did. So it's really important, once again, uh, people like Anthony and Dr. Neem and I can talk all we like from CARP head office about the need to have the, the uh, NASI recommended uh, high dose vaccine available to everybody uh, uh, every senior at no cost, you need to get in touch with your local politicians and make sure they hear it because that's the way that the uh, policies will get changed. There are very few of the medical people and leadership of our provinces that don't believe that they'd like everybody to have it. The holdup is at the policy level and that's your politicians. I have nothing to add. That was oh, perfect. <laughs> terrific. Uh, but maybe specific Dion to our viewers in British Columbia, for example, uh, it's going to be an out of pocket expense if they want the higher dose vaccine for 65 plus. What's your recommendation for what they should do to plan ahead if they really want to get that? Well, you know, more importantly, uh, first of all, the recommendation is from the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations. And they're saying from an individual perspective, you should get the high dose. And so that's that's not Dr. D saying it to you, Dr. Neem saying it to you. That, that's actually a whole pile of really smart people telling you that's the vaccine to get influenza um, vaccine for people 65 years of age and older is the high dose is recommended. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it, you know, we talk to people. I mean, I don't tell anyone what to do. I just provide them the data and then the decision makers make the decision. Uh, they've made the decision in BC that you're going to get uh, in the long-term care. And I believe in seniors homes, you're going to get the high dose, but outside of those facilities, um, you're, you're, going, you're not going to. So um, it's either out of pocket, uh, third party insurance, if you've got that, that might help you out or um, you get what this, the offering is uh, from the British Columbia. Uh, that the actual, yeah, it would be it would BC uh, or the BC province, whatever they decided. I, th I thought about this question as you were presenting, and Paula asks, she has an egg allergy and has never had any vaccinations of any sort, but for the past two years, public health told her she could safely have the flu vaccine. Now, you mentioned the different types. Uh, are, when someone with an egg allergy arrives at their pharmacist, do they specify that and there's the right vaccine available for them? Yeah, actually, it's about anaphylaxis. So if you just have a, a mild egg allergy, you can get vaccinated. If you have anaphylaxis to um, egg, then you, um, you really need to have a chat with someone. Uh, that, that's still the contraindication. So 
you can get uh, vaccines in a facility which has um, like uh, epinephrine, right? So if by chance that you did um, have an anaphylactic reaction, they would give you the epinephrine right away. So you could get it, but that's the, there's a distinguishing line. If you, if you have anaphylaxis, that's contraindication. If you have an egg allergy, that's not a contraindication to the vaccine. So um, just talk to your physician about that. They may have them, so Anthony, I think we're 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 getting to the point now where we're going to have to close uh, close down. However, I want to remind everybody that this is being recorded. Will be available to you. We'll send you uh, the link to the recording. Also, we know there are a number of questions that have not yet been answered. Uh, we have all those down. We'll keep a record of them, and we will do our best to have them answered, and then we'll. Uh, publish them for everybody and 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 let people know where those answers uh, are. So I want to finish off by uh, thanking Dr. Dion Neem so much for doing this uh, today. Obviously, great interest. We had uh, close to 350 people at the peak, prob probably with some of the coming and going. It was actually more individuals uh, than that. And we know there are another couple of hundred that will be watching it. In fact, our experience has been that uh, more people watch the rerun than watch the original. So it'll be interesting to see uh, because, but this topic is so important uh, uh, to all of us, and that's obvious uh, from the interest today. So thank you once again for taking this time out of your, I know, really busy schedule to do this for us. Right. Anytime, Bill. It's, a, it's always a pleasure. Always Great. a pleasure. Thanks, Dan. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Anthony.